You're listening to Leveling Up, and I'm Arielle, be your host. Welcome back to Leveling Up. My name is Ariel Miller, and I'm your host. This is episode six, and I'm calling it Manners Matter. To start off episode six, I decided that I wanted to start with a story to frame it. So, hunker down for story time. On my lunch hour, I was in Sephora looking for an eyebrow pencil. Now, the music in Sephora is pretty loud, but I'm in the store and I'm looking to... Actually, I was distracted. I was looking at lipstick when my mission was for one eyebrow pencil. So I'm looking, but I keep hearing some sort of music. And it's not the store's music, and it's loud. And it's inaudible in the aspect of, like, is it music? Is it a video? Is it a conversation? But it's definitely not the store's music. So I'm looking around and looking over my shoulder, and I, I can't find it. But I'm I'm annoyed by it. Like, this is annoying me because it's... It's definitely affecting my shopping experience because it was not the store's music and it was clearly someone else's thing going on. So I finally look over my right shoulder and there's a woman standing there with her cell phone on her hand with the screen side up and the cell phone's on speaker and she's very clearly having a very audible conversation for all of us to hear on speakerphone. So I look at her and I turn back to what I was looking at, which was the lipstick. And I shake my head and I just look down and shake it from side to side. I don't say anything to her, completely nonverbal, and I shake my head. And I don't see who wouldn't. It's complete and utter disgust because why are you having this conversation in person? Why do I need to hear it? So I hear this woman say, excuse me, do you have a problem? I swivel my head around and I am completely aghast that she had the gall to ask me if I had a problem, to which I respond, well, as a matter of fact, I actually do have a problem. So she asks me what my problem was and I respond with that my problem is the fact that she's on her phone in public on speakerphone without headphones. So I ask her, do you have headphones? And she takes her hand and she presses it on her chest and she she goes, Oh, you are a horrible person. I can't possibly believe you. I can't believe you have the audacity to tell me something like that. You are a horrible human. And I'm like, are we living in the same universe right now? Is this really happening? This woman is so overtly, incredibly inconsiderate and so rude, yet she's attacking my moral character? I was so floored. So this kind of goes back and forth for, I would say, a good four minutes. And we weren't yelling, and it wasn't, and I didn't move any closer to her, and she didn't move any closer to me, but it's very clearly across from an aisle. And it's very obvious a heated conversation is going on, and nobody comes over. And during the course of this conversation, she attacks me and tells me I'm a terrible human. And I tell her to please not attack my moral character. And then I asked her to please take her phone off of speaker phone. And then we part ways. I was really uncomfortable by this exchange. I was really shaken up because in today's day and age, you don't know what people are capable of. But like my biggest thing was the utter disgust that this woman very clearly had for me by being annoyed by her being inappropriate, rude, and inconsiderate. I stood in the register and my heart is racing and I'm like hoping just get out of here get out of here get out of here as fast as possible because I don't know she could have followed me to my car but that is totally beside the point I got into my car and I drove off to the school site that I had to be at and I sat there in my car so hurt and so sad that this is what it's come to and when I say this is what it's come to when I'm out in public And I imagine when you're out in public, too, people walk around holding their phone like it's a silver platter on speakerphone having a conversation. I'm a little confused. Couldn't you just put your phone to your ear and have the same conversation? Like, isn't that a possibility? Like, I'm not quite sure if that is something that you can do. I mean, you're ultimately using your hand anyway, so I'm not quite sure why you can't go ahead and put your phone to your head. But... I am so annoyed by these things that I will actually 
walk away and I will leave a restaurant or things like that. Or I will say something like in this situation. And my husband says, babe, that's just how things are these days. And that's not how things are. Correction. They are that way, but they don't need to be that way and they shouldn't be that way. And we need to work to change it. So in a a uh, study done by the Associated Press, NORC, Center for Public Affairs Research, this is what they found. They found that 74% 74, 74 of Americans think that manners and behavior have deteriorated in the United States over the past several decades. Well, I'm going to come back with a duh. Obviously, it's deteriorated. So my question is, is, well, why do you think that's the case? And take a moment, like a pregnant moment here, to really think about why do you think there has been a moral degradation in our society and what or whom is responsible for this degradation. So who is responsible for this? Not surprisingly, there are clear differences between what older Americans consider to be generally rude versus their younger counterparts. So thank God I'm not a millennial. I was born in 1982, so I'm just on that cusp where I'm not considered a millennial, thankfully. But you know, there's a lot of like bad press that surrounds millennials and I shouldn't say anything negative, but you know, there's a lot of entitlement that comes with, you know, today's day and age or this era, or shall we say kids these days. So when I say that younger counterparts feel differently, they do. Younger counterparts feel that it's appropriate to be in a public place and watch Instagram stories with the sound on. Now, I intentionally post almost every story without sound, and that's a personal preference because I find them to be so incredibly rude, and I don't listen to them with sound. As a matter of fact, my phone is never on. It's always on silent. Why does it need to be on? I have an Apple Watch. I can see a phone call. I can see a text message. And like every other person in the world, my phone is with me, screen side up, so I can see what's happening in the here and now. So... While most people agree that using a cell phone in a restaurant is rude, so most people agree, half of the Americans between the ages of 18 through 29 feel that it's appropriate to use their cell phone in said restaurant compared to only the 22% that are over the age of 60. I found that to be a little bit surprising. I would have thought that people over the age of 60, much less it would have been a lower number than 22% would have found it to be rude. So I'm asking you about what are your thoughts about cell phone use in restaurants or in public places? How does it make you feel? Or if you are one of those people, are you thinking of other people? Why are you using your phone? Why can't it wait? So two anecdotes. My husband and I took our niece out for Chinese food when she was visiting. And we're in a restaurant and there's a family behind us. And there is a child on an iPad playing a game very loud. So loud to the point where it's almost like nails on a chalkboard where I'm, I'm twitching. I'm twitching. I cannot focus on my conversation with my husband and my niece because all I hear is bam, 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 chim, 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 bam, 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 behind me. It's grating on me. My blood is starting to boil. My face is getting red. And I guess arguably you can say maybe that's something that I need to work on, but I don't think I should. I don't think that I should have to work on quelling my blood boiling when I'm in a public space enjoying food and a kid is playing a video game with the sound on. For Christ's sake, carry headphones, mom. So I say to my husband through my teeth and I'm gritting my teeth and I'm like, I'm going to say something. And my husband is typically embarrassed by me and my actions. So I'm cognizant of not embarrassing him. And I turn around to the parent and I just say, hi, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but do you have any headphones or is there any way that you can put that on silent? And the mother and the father said, oh my God, we didn't even know. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. And they, they fixed it. And they wound up leaving shortly thereafter because the kid had a, a complete and utter meltdown, which is a completely separate fact. But, you know, it just took me pointing out that their kid was listening to something with the sound on. And, and here's the thing, and this is what I've observed about parents. They so desperately crave adult time and a conversation that's uninterrupted without mom, 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 or without 
their kid demanding all of their attention. So what they wind up doing is they give their kid a device to entertain them. And it's a substitution for parenting. And that's not okay because parenting these days has come to, let me get you an iPad or a cell phone or here's mommy's cell phone so mommy can drink her glass of wine and talk to daddy. Thanksgiving this past year in 2018, my husband and I were in uh, Solvang, which is just north of Los Angeles, about two hours. And it's a beautiful, beautiful little Danish town and it's just outside of Los Olivos, which is wine country, and we absolutely love it. And we paid to have Thanksgiving dinner, and it was a prefix menu, and dinner was expensive. The food was absolutely phenomenal. We're having the time of our life. Across the restaurant is a larger party with older kids. So I would estimate about between the ages of 8 and 12, and there's about four of them. And then it looks like there's several adults, which I would assume grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad, and maybe like an aunt and uncle. And they've paid for their bill, and they're sitting there, and the kids are playing on phones. Now, we are across the restaurant, and I can hear the phones. The parents almost with their backs to the kids, completely oblivious, having a conversation. My husband and I shift our conversation to the fact that there are kids on their cell phones in public, in a restaurant, on Thanksgiving, and we're across the restaurant and we can hear them. So this starts to dominate our conversation. My husband asked the manager if the manager could say something to the table because it was inappropriate, it was inconsiderate, it was rude, and it was negatively impacting our dining experience that we had paid for. So the manager said, well, you know, they paid their check, they're going to be leaving in a little while, so if they don't leave in a little while, I'll make sure to say something. So that answer sufficed to me, but I had wanted to go over and say something, and I think, yes, the manager is a more appropriate course of action, but I had wanted to say something because I think it's important that people are held accountable, that they're aware that your actions impact others, and there are other people in this space that you are ruining the experience for. So I'd say another eight minutes go by and they're not leaving and the kids are still playing on their phones with the sound on. So we asked the manager again and the manager did ultimately go over to the table and ask the parents to have the kids silence their phones. But here's the issue. And this is the thing that I want to bring up is that we're also afraid of a confrontation. Like we're so afraid of, of saying to someone, Hey, you're being inappropriate. Hey, you're impacting the experience for other people because we don't like confrontation. We don't want other people to be offended or upset. And then the thing is, is people feel entitled. And that's why I say manners matter. Like that woman who was so evidently offended by me holding her accountable to what I would consider social norms or etiquette. So the U.S. Center for Disease and Prevention's estimates that children spend eight hours a day on devices. Eight hours a day. That is just as much, or if not longer, than the kids are in school. Eight hours a day watching Netflix, scrolling through social media, playing video games, texting friends. I mean, what are they doing? Creating videos, <laughs> watching YouTube videos. This is dangerous. And here's why it's dangerous. And I did a lot of research for this because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just like me on my soapbox saying, parents, I need you to be parents. But as a teacher, a lot of what we see in schools, this degradation of morality and how there's no moral fiber binding society anymore, it starts in the home. It really does. So children, first and foremost, are not getting enough exercise. Type 2 diabetes or juvenile diabetes is on the rapid rise. It's estimated that within the next five years, three out of five children are going to suffer from juvenile diabetes. And we're talking about type 2 diabetes that could have been prevented through exercise. Forget about the diet situation that's moot here. Children aren't getting enough exercise because they are sitting at home on their phone. They're not playing outside. They're not playing with their brothers and sisters. They're not running around. What they're doing is they're lying down on their back in a bed with a cell phone right underneath their face where they are just watching. They could be reading, but they're just watching. So children who have exposure to devices are actually at an increased risk of cancer. So I'm sure you know this, but our phones and our computers emit radiation, which is why science or research and scientists implore us to please, 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 please not sleep with our cell phones 
phone's next to us because when our cell phone is next to our head, you're literally just exposing yourself to this unnecessary radiation. Young children are at a higher risk of exposure to said radiation from these devices. And that comes from the American Society of Cancer. So these reputable, well-respected organizations are on the record saying, please, please, please limit technology exposure and use for your young children because they're at an increased risk of cancer because of their age. We also know that an early exposure and use of technology delays cognitive development. So valuable visual, spatial, and motor skills are needed in order to lead a normal life. And these things are developed through play, through interacting with one's environment, through going outside. So this visual, spatial, and motor skill development can only be cultivated through organic play. And organic play doesn't happen through a creative game. So while there are cognitive games, and I'll be the first one to say that there are a lot of really great educational games, even though that there are these great creative games, they are not creating and cultivating the kind of awareness that children need to have that happens through interacting with their environment. So children as young as two to three years old are experiencing also, we talked about this visual skills, are experiencing uh, eye strain at two to three years old because the radioactive rays are harmful to developing eyes. In addition to the radioactive rays being damaging to their eyes, It causes eye fatigue, so eye fatigue, blurry vision, and focus issues, and these are things that we didn't see in youth prior to the rise of technology. Bad posture. Bad posture is also a symptom of an excessive technology exposure, and what happens in young children is a misalignment of the spinal cord. Additionally, this hunched over, shoulders in, chin to chest, is is unhealthy, and As an adult, there is actually a thing called text neck. Text neck. I know it's kind of hard to see with or hear, but text neck, right? And that is from people looking down and not looking up and how our cervical spine is in this position that is not natural for us to be in. And ultimately, people are seeking medical attention because of the strain on their neck. As a matter of fact, I had a friend who... She's a chef, and it's not from technology, but it's the same exact condition from looking down, who actually now is in a collar, a neck brace, because of the strain on her neck from looking down. So it's not exclusive to just technology use, but it is a very real thing. The two most important points that, or actually, yeah, the two most important points that I want to address regarding this exposure to technology in children and how it affects society in the long run is that it stunts or prevents social development. So children who are interacting with technology at a young age, it fails to teach kids how to share, how to be respectful, how to listen to others, how to make eye contact. Children that are not outside learning how to play with their friends, how to collaborate, how to cooperate. We're setting them up for failure because they're going to have to collaborate, corroborate, work together in any endeavor in which they pursue in the workplace. They're going to have to learn how to work as a team. And if they don't have that experience starting from a very early age, just getting it in school in a group project isn't going to be enough to teach children how to be part or play part of a greater whole. So when children Children don't have the chance to interact with people organically. There is no mechanism to show how that they're being rude or to teach them that they're being rude. There is no way to show them that what they're doing is inappropriate because there is no feedback from a phone. From a device, it is one-sided, it's one-dimensional. There is no facial expression. There is no person who can indicate displeasure, happiness, enthusiasm, disgust, sadness. So it greatly impacts how children are able to perceive emotions and an awareness of how to treat others. And what I also, and I I talk about this a lot on this podcast, is the exposure to social media at a young age. I just watched a fantastic documentary called Embrace, Embrace on Netflix about body image internationally. And children as young as four through eight years old 
are looking, and, and girls in particular, looking at magazines and, and wondering why they don't have a six pack or an eight pack. So the messaging that we see and that we hear that comes through social media on our devices has um, damaging psychological effects on our children. Additionally, social media breeds this instant gratification because it's right there all the time. Double tap and a heart appears on Instagram. DM your friends on Facebook, post a status, get likes, get responses. Like there's all these different things that happen through social media that happen, boom, instantly. Now, that's not the real world. My experience as a classroom teacher has been that social media has bred poor online etiquette or poor etiquette for interacting with someone uh, via email and digitally. I am a child's teacher. It is an inappropriate forum for a child to direct message me on Instagram and be like, hey miss, what's the homework? Yes, my Instagram is public, but it is not the avenue. Is it appropriate for me to email, or excuse me, for me to Facebook my boss and be like, hey man, I'm not going to be at work tomorrow. Thought I'd let you know. No, it's not appropriate. But if we are not teaching children appropriate ways to utilize technology at a young age, these behaviors that breed unprofessionalism start to happen. If they go unchecked, what happens is, is there's no mechanism, like I mentioned, for kids to know what's right and what's wrong. And to no fault of their own. To no fault of their own are these kids, they're just, they're just living in a digital world, right? So the way they interact is through direct messenger on Instagram. As a matter of fact, they don't exchange phone numbers anymore. Kids don't know each other's phone numbers. The way that they contact people are through a texting apps and through Instagram. And because you don't actually need to have a cell phone provider to use Instagram or texting apps, all you need is access to Wi-Fi. Everyone is using it. So, and there's Wi-Fi everywhere. With that is that we're not teaching kids how to attach documents or they don't learn that through playing video games or scrolling through social media. They don't learn how to convert a Word document to a PDF. They don't learn how to create an appropriate subject line in an email. You know how many emails I get from my middle schoolers, even high schoolers, where the body of the email is in the subject line. So the subject line is this massive, massive thing, and it's the email. Or where they will address me in slang. Or, you know, I get an email from smiley555 at yahoo.com. Hey, miss, I was absent today. I know that I need to make up the work, but I won't be in for the next three days, and I'm not sure what it is. Can you tell me what it is so I can get caught up? Awesome. Great. Uh, who are you? There is no greeting. There is no signature. There's no nothing. I don't know who you are. You know, smiley555, five, 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 not very helpful, right? So how do we fix this? How do we keep our children safe and healthy? And I say safe and healthy, meaning fit, cognitively stimulated. How do we keep our kids socially aware or cultivate social adeptness? I mean, how do we teach our kids manners? Oh, how do we teach our kids manners? Well, first, it's called parenting. I'm just going to throw it on out there, like it and love it. I mean, or don't, but it's seriously, it's called parenting. But aside from that, here is how we can go ahead and flip the script. Monitoring screen time, setting boundaries as a parent. You have all the control. Increasing outdoor activities. This isn't just kicking your kids outside and demanding that they play. I grew up on the East Coast and I grew up in an era before technology and we didn't come on till the streetlights came home or our mothers called us from the front porch. It would be the dead of winter. And I'm like, mom, I'm bored. Put your coat on. Go outside. Mom, it's cold. Put your gloves on. Put your hat on. Go. And that's what we did. We went outside and we played outside. I couldn't tell you what we did. I mean, I can tell you. We did most ridiculous things. We used to dig ditches and we would hide in them. I swear to God. We would also go looking for snails. We'd ride our bikes. Yes, we rode our bikes. Increase outdoor activities. Hiking as a family. My family used to take us to the nature preserve. I grew up on Long Island. And my father would take my sister and I to the nature preserve where we'd walk through the dunes on these wooden boardwalks. And then we'd lie on our bellies, hanging over the boardwalk, looking for little crabs and sea stars and little animals inside or just kind of playing on the banks of the marsh and things like that. And here I am at nearly 37 years old 
and that's what I remember. I remember from my childhood taking winter picnics growing up, like I said, on, in New York and Long Island. We would bundle up. We have pictures of my sister and I looking like these massive little Stay Puft Marshmallow men with our puffy jackets and hats and our gloves hanging off of our jackets because they were clipped on. And we're sitting on the beach in the blistery winter wind having a picnic. And while that may not sound like the hotbed of excitement, it was special. And we were outside and we were connecting as a family. And that's the thing. Connection. Building relationships. Being close to those that you love. I don't remember playing Super Nintendo. I had it, but I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't care. But I remember those precious times with my family. I remember going camping as a parent. Model that. Go outside with your kid. Monitor screen time for yourself as well. And for the love of God, stop distracting kids with a device. I know this is going to sound shocking, but I'm going to say, give your kids crayon. Yes, crayon and a coloring book. It works wonders. Why do you think as adults they have adult coloring books? Because it's therapeutic and it's fun. Cooking. Cooking is another way as an outlet for children to, you know, expend energy. And they're doing something with you and it's teaching them how to cook, first of all, but also it's teaching them some math. You know, you're giving them life skill, teaching them how to read because they have to read the recipe. They have to follow steps. It's expository text, which is all common core, my friends, is following directions, reading things, and creating something. And the thing is about cooking is you've made it. It's special. Arts and craft, paint, glue, scissors, glitter, make it rain. Seriously. Kids love that stuff. Lincoln Logs, Legos, like all of those things. And they're also really good for kids and their fine motor skills. And then you have something, again, much like cooking, you have a masterpiece that has been created. Puzzles. You need to occupy a kid, give the kid a puzzle. Puzzles, again, are good for cognitive development. And then there are creative toys, toys that force kids to think, you know, Rubik's Cubes and other things that are going to hone in on young children's motor skills, fine motor skills, and then also also cognitive, uh, cultivate their cognitive development. We have to monitor sleep cycles as well. Children's minds are so active. They're developing, they're growing, and there's this world around them that they're it's so sensory and it's just, you know, it's being overloaded into their brain. So it's important that they get 10 hours of sleep a day. So giving them that 10 hours of sleep a day, like I said, monitoring that screen time, but making sure that the kids are not exposed to their technology for at least two hours before bed because of the light that is emitted from the phone. Now, if you do absolutely positively need to use your device, let's say late at night, or the children need to, or they need to use it in a dark room, which by the way is harmful, there is a setting, at least on iPhones, where you can set it to a red light. And a red light has been shown to not impact our brainwaves negatively late at night. So that is an alternative solution that if the kids do need to utilize a device, or even if you do in bed late at night, although it is strongly discouraged to use. We mentioned the eye strain on children before. So keeping our devices, and this also goes for adults, but 20 inches away Away from our face and bodies. And that's to minimize a eye strain, but also radiation exposure. And what I would consider to be a pretty important point to protecting family time would be no phones at the table. I'm talking about no phones at the table, not face down next to you, which we all do, present company included. No phones at the table, not on vibrate, nowhere near the table. Make family time dinner time. Make dinner time sacred time. I grew up in a house where we ate dinner together every night, the four of us. Even now when I visit my parents, if I'm not coming home for dinner, I need to call them and let them know that I'm not coming home for dinner. We ate dinner together as a family every night. Even when I was a shitty teenager and I was fighting with my parents, even when I was grounded, even when I hated the sight of them, I had to come down from my room, sit there, eat their food, clean up, and then go back to my room. We cooked dinner together. We cleaned up together. We made our lunches for the next day together. Emphasis on together. So we talk about this degradation of society. This We no longer have that system of the checks and balances of what's rude and what's not rude. Well, yeah, of course, because we're not getting that FaceTime at home. We're not talking to our kids. We're not interacting as a family. We are not protecting family time. We are not saying that I value interpersonal relationships. Good manners come from and start in the home. And as an educator, educators have a 
a responsibility to mirror the etiquette needed to function politely and respectfully in society. As an educator, we should be holding ourselves to the highest of highest standards when it comes to modeling this kind of appropriate behavior. So aside from parents and educators, you, everyone else, plays a role in preserving the tenets of a world where people can enjoy being in public without fear or anxiety that cell phone use will ruin it. And I say fear or anxiety because I don't go to the movies. I do not go to the movies and I love the movies. You know why I don't go to the movies? Because I can't stand people being rude. People taking phone calls in the movie theaters. People not putting their Apple watches on theater mode so it doesn't light up. Or people checking text messages in the movies or sending texts. And that is why I don't go to the movies anymore because I cannot stand how it makes me feel. So ultimately, as a consumer and as a person in society, I'm no longer able to participate the way that I would like to because the actions of others are negatively impacting my experiences. So what are these things, these entitled behaviors, or what are these behaviors that come from not setting boundaries in the home or not setting firm boundaries or parameters in our society. Here's what I got for you. In no particular order, by the way. One, talking on your cell phone at the cash register. Two, using your cell phone, as I've mentioned, at a restaurant, in the movies, or in a library or another place that it should be quiet. And that also goes for an airplane. Talking on your phone on an airplane when we are getting ready to take off, when we're in the air, or when we are taxiing on the runway to our gate, guess what? Everyone can hear you. Everyone. We're listening to your conversation. We can even hear the person on the other end. Talking on the phone in the car as a passenger. And let me tell you, there is nothing worse than when I'm with a friend and they take phone calls and I'm driving. Like, I am driving, like I'm not a chauffeur. You can pick up the call real quick and say, hey, I'm out with my friend, can I call you later? Or shoot them a text and say, I can't talk right now, I'll call you later. But nothing grinds my gears more than when I'm driving a friend somewhere and they take a call. Granted, yes, there's a time and a place where you may need to do it, but it's so rude and it's inconsiderate. And it says that my time is more important than your time. And nobody's time is any more important than anyone else's. Time is a resource that once it's gone, you don't get it back. Everyone's time is important. Another thing, when people are talking to you and you're on your phone, incredibly rude. Talking on your phone in public, on speakerphone, playing music, videos, games without headphones, again, in a public space, not silencing your phone when interacting with people, specifically if you're having a text conversation, it's going ding, 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 ding. Dude, just flip the switch down. Again, it's a cognizance of other people. Other people can hear it and you are impacting other people's ability to enjoy this same space. And finally, taking pictures or videos of other people in public without their permission and posting it on social media or making a meme. And I felt it important to say that because people do that. People photograph other people and post it online. There was a social media influencer who took a picture of a woman in the gym in the locker room naked and you couldn't see anything but it was you know this woman's body and this woman posted it on social media shaming her for her physique and calling her fat and gross and disgusting and it went viral and not viral for the good reason but viral because oh my god this woman did something so egregious like there is no sacred space anymore I'm in the gym and there's placards everywhere that say, please do not use your cell phone in the locker room because people are using their cell phones in the locker room. Again, it comes back to holding that line as a parent, as a teacher, as a participant in society. Yes, cell phones absolutely bridge gaps that used to span continents and they they marry the continents and there's no boundaries and borders anymore. However, because cell phone use is so accessible, it is not an excuse to be rude nor is it carte blanche to be selfish when your actions negatively affect others. So I'm getting real crazy here. I am actually asking you to think of someone other than yourself. And that's what this is about because manners matter. Just because you have a cell phone doesn't mean that you're entitled to use it whenever and wherever. Remember that manners start in the home. Children will mimic and ultimately see, then learn based on what you do and what you don't do. Learn is the key word here because being rude 
is learned behavior. And with just a little mindfulness, my friends, together, we can improve how people interact with one another. Thank you so much for listening to Manners Matter on Leveling Up with Ariel Miller. It's been a pleasure sharing this with you. I would love to connect with you on social media, so please hit me up on Instagram at Ariel underscore Miller. And if you enjoy this podcast, please do not forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thank you so much for listening. Love you. Mean it. Mwah!